Entwined is a podcast about how so much of the world around us is wound or twisted together. This podcast strives to lay bare unexposed or indiscernible connections using historical and anecdotal sources. I am Elliot Gladstone, and alongside P.S. McKay, this is Entwined. Chances are, likely without a doubt, you have experienced movement in some form within your lifetime. Maybe something as simple as the batting of an eyelash, or potentially it is something more complex and terrifying, like being trapped in a basement as a tornado touches down, sucking the air from the space around you and out into the night. Movement, it's nothing to take for granted, and yet, As humans, we hastily move through our days, never considering how it has impacted our lives. Our movements, our migrations, our thought processes, our ability to take up the physical and intellectual space is fluid, but it can be dramatically impacted by the world around us. Like weather, oceans, and electricity, humans seem to flow through time and space, almost as if influenced by some unseen force or current. Every twitch, every spasm is a result of an electrical impulse. We literally run on electricity. Electricity and the electric current have a well-known history. In 1752, a well-known American by the name of Benjamin Franklin set out to test a theory that he would later coin electric fire. This was actually fluid that could be passed from one body to another, an electric current. Interestingly enough, Franklin never wrote about or documented his famous romp through the thunderstorm while flying his kite. No, this is totally true. In fact, Most accounts don't even have the moment discussed in writing until at least 15 years later. Ben was, is, will always be an interesting figure. I mean, there is so much to the man. And to top it off, he lived at a time of political independence and growth. A bit of self-discovery in the royal sense. Pun totally intended there. Franklin was out there in the inclement weather, possibly in the rain, and struggling against a measure of wind with his 21-year-old son, William Franklin, at his side, with the sole purpose to demonstrate electricity for the betterment of humanity. Franklin's discovery was well-preserved for us forever, as he was able to generate an electric charge in a key he had attached to a makeshift kite. That same key has also been frequently reported as being a small metal spike. Benjamin's son, William, was born out of wedlock, and as he grew up near Philadelphia, he would never know his birth mother. William followed his father into Europe to develop his scientific knowledge, as well as attain a master's from Oxford. William was sweet on the European lifestyle, a term which has a tremendous meaning in 2016, but meant something completely different back in 1762. William Franklin ended up back in the colonies and was appointed governor of New Jersey in 1763. William found his job as governor easy at first, but as the tension between the colonies and England grew, he found it increasingly difficult to maintain order. He understood and respected a number of American issues, but his years in England had solidified his political position. William, illegitimate son of Benjamin Franklin, was considered a Tory and one of the more famous loyalists of the time period. Actually, the Tory party struggled in the years prior to the rule of King George III. 
and at this time those who considered themselves Tories were actually referred to as the King's Friends. Tories as a party actually no longer exist and have been survived by the British Conservative Party whom still think of themselves, well, as Tories. As time passed, his involvement as a loyalist increased and William found himself estranged from his father. The American Revolutionary War was on the horizon and William Franklin found himself feeding information from the New Jersey area directly to England. William's father, now 70, signed the Declaration of Independence, which seemed to be contrarian to everything William stood for. While Ben Franklin was outlaying some seriously important groundwork for the future of America, his son William was being arrested and locked up in a Connecticut prison because of his loyalty to King George III. The two, father and son, were dragged through the currents of time with purpose, each having their impact, each unaware of how their significance would be tracked by future generations. William Franklin wasn't the only famous American who desired to grow old in a colonial system. In fact, there were several others just like him who were willing to fight alongside the Redcoats in the Revolutionary War. Men who were willing to fight were invaluable to England because there were so few local supporters to the cause. One of those men was a man by the name of John Adison. John Adison was a Dutch farmer from New Jersey. Yeah, New Jersey. That's the very same place where William Franklin was operating before his imprisonment. It's also the same place we refer to today as the Garden State. Adison had made a home for himself in one of the more geographically significant spots from the Revolutionary War. New Jersey had a long coastline and several bays, which made it desirable for commercial shipping and as a result, several battles were fought in the area. Adison and his family were smack dab in the middle of the conflict, and as a supporter of Great Britain, he was not on board with any temporary or permanent separation from England. Adison considered himself a Tory, or one of the King's friends, and as an American Revolution came to a close, he saw a need to get the heck out of Dodge. That there, folks, is a Gunsmoke reference, and not a literal reference to a migratory plan of the Adison family. After England's failure to retain the colonies in the American Revolution, the British government often relocated families who were loyal to his or her majesty, and the Adison family would be fortunate enough to experience the same fate. Think about this concept just for a moment. England was an ocean away from the colonies and had only a few supporters who survived the war and those who survived and still lived in the area were relocated out of the immediate region and into a friendly Canadian province. For loyalists living in New Jersey, like the Adison family, that meant getting relocated to Canada because their land had been confiscated and they found themselves confronted with the possibility of imprisonment. For the Adison family, it also meant making a subtle change to the spelling of their last name. In 1784, John Adison fled from America and moved his family to Ontario. And at that time, the spelling of their last name was officially altered to the spelling of Edison. John Adison now Edison, laid down his roots and started to grow his family. Their son Samuel Edison Sr. was a stubborn man and a lot like his father John when it came to his political affiliations. Samuel was the father to many children, including one who carried his namesake, Samuel Edison Jr. Sam Sr. found himself a captain in a Canadian regiment and fought against Yes, just like his father John, he was fighting against America. But this round, it was the War of 1812. 
The War of 1812 was an interesting conflict, but it isn't germane to the story, and you need only concern yourself with the idea that Samuel Edison Sr. participated. So, okay, all right, I apologize for any confusion here, but the junior-senior thing was a lot more common in the 1800s, and it's difficult to appropriately designate each man when needed. So going forward, Samuel Edison Jr. will just be referred to as Junior. So Junior would end up being a little bit different than his pops and grandpops. Junior would find work laying shingles, working as a tailor, and even tending a local tavern. Junior ended up being a whole lot less connected to the causes than his ancestors, and he was more focused on himself than his family. Junior found love in a woman by the name of Nancy Elliott, who was a school teacher, and more interestingly, a daughter of the American Revolution. Whoa there, hang on. Yes, Junior went out and found a girl whose father was a captain in General Washington's army, and eventually President Washington's army. Nancy was a teacher by profession and had to be noted for her charity. The two lived in Canada, but were not at all fond of the government system and eventually found themselves in support of a Scottish-born journalist by the name of William Lyon Mackenzie. William Lyon Mackenzie was born in Dundee, Scotland, where he worked in his family's general store and for the local newspaper. Mackenzie came on hard times and hopped a ship to Canada with one of his good friends, John Leslie. The two men were committed to being successful and opened a general store after their arrival to Canada. The relationship was unable to survive the political climate and eventually dissolved. Mackenzie continued to move towards New York, where he became a successful newspaper publisher for the Colonial Advocate. Mackenzie used his newspaper as a means to be openly critical about the government system, which likely was a springboard for becoming more and more focused on impacting political change. Mackenzie planned serious political adjustments and managed to join forces with those looking to reform the government. Reformers were a group focused on reconstruction, infrastructure, and a balanced budget. Wait, that doesn't sound too terrible, does it? William Lyon Mackenzie became so infatuated with the American Constitution that he wrote a paper called, wait for it, The Constitution, which was symbolically scheduled to be published on July 4th. The Constitution was made in Canada, but inspired by America, and provided the roadmap for how to reform the current system, but more significantly, it made mention of how to apply resistance if political change didn't occur. Mackenzie and his crew, which included Samuel Edison Jr., presented the government with countless peaceful alternatives, but were eventually forced into mobilizing the farming communities to resist the government in an effort to spark change. Just like that, a rebellion was organized, and it was scheduled for December 7, 1837. The rebellion would end up unsuccessful, and the government was just too organized and too powerful. Ultimately, the revolution was a losing battle, and it forced both William Mackenzie and Samuel Edison Jr. to flee Canada to avoid prison. After escaping the consequences of their involvement in the rebellion, Jr. bounced around several American cities before he finally ended up in Milan, Ohio. Mylan would be the final stop, and it would also bring a temporary end to the Edison family landing on the wrong side of political conflicts. Now in America, and growing older, Junior found himself confronted with yet another decision to make. Did he believe in the sovereignty of the states, or was he more interested in the concept of an indivisible nation with a sovereign national government? With the Civil War looming, Jr. found himself outside recruitment offices talking with the young men who would be going off to fight for the Union Army. 
just in case you didn't pay attention, in eighth grade, the Union Army was the Northern Army, the side who won. The Southern Army was the Confederate Army, led by General Lee, and not so much winners. The Civil War was an interesting time, and worthy of its own, or possibly several, podcasts. To say there was a lot that happened would be the understatement of the bicentennial. The political current was volatile, but as with many of the military conflicts of the 18th and 19th century, it provided for an economic boom and allowed individuals to excel in many different ways. Some elected to grow their families, some looked for creative ways to become more civilized. Many found there was a tremendous amount of money to be made and still others leveraged a previous lack of innovation to improve the lives of the people around them. One gentleman who found a way to make a fortune during the Civil War was an American by the name of Adam Forpaugh. Forpaugh was not an educated man as he ran away from home before he was a teenager. At the time, as a nine-year-old, he worked in his father's butcher shop and actually earned a wage. Forpaugh bought a home for an eye-popping $4 a month. If you plug that $4 into any internet inflation calculator, you see that those four bucks are equal to around $110 today. But heck, he was nine. Forpaw headed to New York by way of Ohio, and through hard work and a little natural ability, he launched a business which ended up making him a ton of money. The business was simple. He would sell livestock, but more specifically, horses. Forpaw quickly garnered a reputation for having a pronounced ability to identify a quality horse and became one of the largest purveyors of horses in the state of New York. Adam Forpaugh even climbed into bed with the Union Army and made his fortune selling horses to the government during the Civil War. So what makes Adam so interesting? Well, it was thought through his business dealings that he started his next business venture. Often he would deal livestock using credit, and when someone would not be able to make the payment, he would dissolve his liens by taking ownership of their collateral. One piece of interesting collateral he obtained was a circus which started a lifelong competition with P.T. Barnum and the Ringling Brothers. Forpaw put his livestock skills to work and started to accumulate elephants from other parts of the world to play a role in his circus. He purchased a large elephant, one of the first to claim being born in America. FYI, actually not true, total lie by the name of Topsy. Topsy was a large elephant with a crooked tail that participated in several shows until it was sold to a circus operating on Coney Island in the late 1800s. Competition is good. It often brings out the best in people as they demonstrate capabilities they themselves didn't know they had. Sometimes it's possible for competition to provide an excuse for some, well, less than desirable decision making. Either way, the pursuit of the American dream made it possible in part by Benjamin Franklin that fateful day brought many ideas and concepts to market. With the Civil War just getting started, a man by the name of Thomas Alva Edison, son of Samuel Edison Jr., grandson of Samuel Edison Sr., and great-grandson of John Adison was becoming a teenager. Thomas Edison, often referred to as Al in his younger years, was pretty much a hot mess. Al got into a lot of trouble as he struggled to figure out his place in the world. Some of his greatest hits were getting trapped in a grain elevator, falling into a canal and getting stuck, and my personal favorite, setting fire to his dad's barn just to see what would happen. He was a pretty curious kid, but being curious when it came to your father's barn meant a public lashing in front of the entire town. I'd like to take two seconds to whomever invented the timeout and the concept of grounding, because if 
the whipping thing was still around, well, let's just say I would have earned a few growing up. So, Edison was growing up, and right about the time Forepaw was unloading horses to the U.S. government, Edison found himself in the position to save a child from being hit by a train. A pretty stand-up thing to do, if you ask me. The child was the son of a man named J.U. McKenzie. No relationship to William Lyon McKenzie, although that would have been totally awesome. And to repay Edison for his kindness, Mr. McKenzie agreed to teach Edison telegraphy. These lessons started his long love affair with telegraphy and ended up being the springboard for several of his future inventions. The list of things that Thomas Alva Edison has invented over the years is long, but it pales in comparison to the amount of patents he owned. Edison invented the phonograph, carbon microphone, movie camera, and the mimeograph, but no invention would be more significant than when he demonstrated the incandescent light bulb in 1879. The incandescent light bulb produces light by passing an electric current through it until the filament grows with incandescent light. In 1879, folks were not too focused on efficiency because the Edison light bulb was able to boast a full 5% efficiency, which means most of the energy created to create light was lost in the process. With so much excitement about his recent patent, Edison, now no longer called Al in his adult years, parlayed his research into the development of the direct current. Direct current, or DC as it's known, was the first standard for electricity in the United States, but there wasn't a solution for how to transfer the electricity long distances. DC was so much better suited for the charging of batteries than it was for electrifying a city. Edison worked hard on a solution to his problem, and with the help of one assistant, Nikola Tesla, he put all of his efforts into creating a transformer to change voltage. Tesla was frustrated with Edison, and as a result, he only worked for the man for about six months. Tesla would eventually patent the alternating current transformer while working as a consultant for George Westinghouse. Alternating current or AC as it's known, is different from direct current because it reverses its direction while flowing in a circuit, and thus was born the War of the Currents. Edison held many patents in the United States, and several of those were high-value patents which relied on direct current versus the success of Westinghouse's alternating current. Okay, extreme oversimplification about to happen. So put your science hat on or take your science hat off, whoever you are, however that works. But if you think about electricity moving between two points, the DC or direct current will go from one point to the other. Whereas the AC or alternating current will go back and forth between the two points. The other major difference is that AC, or alternating current, could be transferred long distances quickly and cheaply with the invention of the AC transformer. Okay, okay, I get it. There is so much science nerd stuff that is being left out here, but please take comfort that I literally read dozens of websites and other source material to bring you the details, and unfortunately, I still really have no idea how to explain it quickly enough really for a history podcast. Okay, back to Canada and New York. In 1893, George Westinghouse was awarded a contract over Edison to generate power from Niagara Falls. Tesla and Westinghouse knew they could generate power quickly and more efficiently using their AC current model, but the world was not sure. Many thought Tesla would fail to power Buffalo, but Westinghouse knew the design was sound and Tesla would likely be able to power the whole eastern seaboard. Edison wanted Tesla to fail, but more so he wanted the people to turn on him because AC he felt was just too dangerous. FYI, not true. Edison was so interested in giving AC a bad name that he secretly funded the execution of a murderer with the hopes that the people of America would brand alternating current with a bad name. He hoped that the name would become synonymous with death. 
the opportunistic Edison located a man by the name of William Kremler, who was sentenced to death because he was convicted of killing his wife with a hatchet. Edison pushed to have the man executed by electric shock, using alternating current to get the deed done. Westinghouse knew Edison was up to something and actually supported Kremler's last chance appeal. In the end, the appeal failed and Kremler was executed in what can only be considered a complete and utter debacle. Kremler was shocked more than once and for several minutes because after the first round of being shocked, the man was still alive. And in the end, it took over eight full minutes to execute him. Later, Westinghouse was quoted by saying, you could have done it better if you used an ax. As terrible as this was, it wasn't the last time Edison was involved in a public execution using electric shock. It wasn't the first and it wasn't the last. In 1902, the elephant that was previously owned by Adam Forpaw and living inside the Coney Island Amusement Park by the name of Topsy trampled a man to death. The owners of the park planned to hang Topsy. Maybe it was just the time, but these guys actually wanted to invite spectators and charge admission. Absolutely horrible, by the way. In 1903, Topsy was electrocuted and died almost instantly which has been preserved forever in a Thomas Edison film called Electrocuting an Elephant. A film which lives on because of YouTube, and I do not recommend that any of you watch this footage. I haven't posted it, and I don't plan on posting it. The elephant's trainer actually was offered $25 to put her to death. And as a lover of animals, he rejected that sum and said he wouldn't do it for a thousand bucks. It was a gruesome scene. So much electricity was used that one of the Edison assistants was almost killed when he flipped the switch to start the electric current. And all for the betterment of his idea, not necessarily the betterment of humanity. The Edison, or Edison, family seemed to get on the wrong side of conflict in general over the years, and it should not come as a surprise that Thomas Alva Edison found himself on the wrong side of the War of the Currents. In the end, we still use AC and DC, but not for the purpose Edison intended direct current for in the 1800s. It's funny, remember the incandescent light bulb Edison invented in 1879? Well. He actually wasn't the first to demonstrate that technology either. One of the first successful tests was completed in 1835 by a man named James Bowman from Dundee, Scotland. Dundee, that name sounds familiar. You may remember that was the exact same town that William Lyon Mackenzie was from. Edison, well, he didn't really invent the light bulb. He was the first to patent it though. Nowadays, the name Tesla has a different meaning. As I say the name to you, you're probably thinking of the fancy new cars that have a ton of torque and run on batteries. When the company's founders were testing out names, they knew they wanted to give a nod to the great pioneers in the industry. After much debate, they ended up having a battle between Nikola Tesla and Michael Faraday, with Tesla obviously winning out. For those of you unfamiliar with the Tesla automobile, it's actually pretty darn cool. It looks amazing, it performs well, and it does it all without using one ounce of gas. The Tesla automobiles use different types of charging stations to charge the onboard battery, so the vehicle can travel over 150 miles using just the electricity from the outlet in most homes throughout America. The connector sends alternating current from the wall or AC into the charger. The vehicle's charger then converts the AC power into direct current or DC and sends it to the battery where it will be stored so it can be used. Did you catch that? Anyone? Anyone? Did anyone catch that? Bueller? Bueller? Yep, Nikola Tesla. Remember, he was a genius who put a significant amount of energy, 
again, pun totally intended, into making sure the world used the most efficient means of electricity, alternating current. And his once boss, an enemy, in the quote-unquote War of the Currents was Thomas Edison, who was a man who put all of the power he had, again, pun totally intended, into trying to get direct current to be the standard. And here we are in 2016, as a vehicle that carries Tesla's namesake is charged using the exact type of electricity Thomas Edison wanted to bring to the world. Okay, I'll leave you with this. In many cities across America, there are power companies with Edison somewhere in their name, including Southern California, where there is no shortage of high-end automobiles. Think about it this way. In Los Angeles, the Edison Power Company literally moves electricity using Tesla's AC technology into homes, which is then converted into Edison's DC technology as it charges the batteries in Tesla automobiles. How's that for a little bit of situational irony for you? Thank you for listening. This has been Entwined. Entwined is a podcast that releases every other week and is written, recorded, edited, and produced by Elliot Gladstone and P.S. McKay. This episode was written by Elliot Gladstone. Please tune in next time to see what P.S. McKay has in store for us. For more information about the show or the authors, please check out entwinepodcast.com or visit our Twitter page at entwinepodcast. Podcast.